Hey everyone, how's your reading month been? I've had ups and downs this month. Um, I read quite a lot. I've read um, several books, uh, but and I barely ever give up on reading a book. But I've been trying to get better on DNFing books because, um, like, if I'm not enjoying it and if I'm not really getting anything out of it, then why keep reading it? You know. So um, I'm trying to, yeah, give up on more. So I'll talk about. Um, those that I gave up on, uh, but also several others that I really enjoyed. But first, I have to tell you a story, uh, which is another awkward encounter with an author story. And I know I, you must be getting tired of these. I've, I've told a lot of them. But this is the awkward encounter with an author story to end all awkward encounters. It's, it's like, I can't imagine anything worse than this. And actually, it didn't happen to me. It happened to my boyfriend at an event that we went to. So we went to a book event at a small bookshop. And when we arrived, my boyfriend had to use the toilet. So uh, it's a small bookshop. So there's just one toilet in the basement of this shop. So he went down and he opened the door and uh, somebody was sat on the toilet who had forgot to lock the door when they went in. And this person, I'm not gonna say who they are because it'd be really embarrassing for them, uh, but this person is a very famous award-winning author. Uh, they, the, this author wasn't speaking at the event, so like I'm not giving anything away. They were just there to be in the audience. And uh, yeah, so he opened the door and there was this author, like imagine he, how mortifying that is, like opening the toilet door and seeing sat on the toilet, an author you admire so much, and that's your first encounter with them. Um, yeah, he was totally mortified, and like he, he came back up really like red-faced and embarrassed, and um, he said the, the author was like fine, and, and you know, was obviously embarrassed themselves, but like it, it was fine, but really, uh, yeah, cringe-worthy. And like, I, I just can't imagine like a worse encounter than that. Um, let me know if you can. Right, on to what I read. Uh, so I wanted to read more uh, books from the International Booker Prize uh, list. Uh, so I picked up Flights by Olga Torkacha. Uh, this was a couple weeks before the prize was, this was actually announced as the winner of the prize. Uh, but I just couldn't get on with this book. Uh, so let this be a lesson that like not all prize winners, you know, are guaranteed successes. I mean, a lot of people have really loved and connected with this book, but I, I just couldn't. Uh, and although not everyone has, and one person who sort of warned me about it or warned all of us about it um, was Kamal, uh, who made a uh, booktube video about the international prize uh, shortlist. and. And he said on that video what, how he, um, he feels this patriotic loyalty to Torcaccia and he thinks his, her writing is really powerful, but, uh, but this isn't her, necessarily her best book or the one that he would suggest people start with reading. Uh, and this is the first book I've read by her. And yeah, I just couldn't like, honestly, I couldn't tell you exactly what this book is about it other than sort of, uh, travel and journeys and it's like made up of uh, disparate stories um, which don't really connect with each other. Although the writing is really beautiful, she writes about identity and communities in a really striking way, uh, but it was sort of, it, it was in bits and pieces and I just couldn't form it into a coherent whole. And, and one part I got really annoyed with uh, was um, one section sort of in an airport where she's talking about um, being in an airport and seeing these travel size, uh, you know, toiletries that um, people uh, can buy when they're traveling. And she, she sort of expounds on it and she writes how um, it is as if the cosmetic industry sees the phenomenon of travel as mirroring, mirroring sedentary life, but in miniature, a cute little baby version of the same. And it's, it's like there's this author sitting in this airport um, seeing these travel-sized things and, and trying to find a more profound meaning in them. They're, they're just there for practical use. It's like it, you don't need to make something bigger out of it. And um, yeah, I get, I get 
frustrated by that type of writing that it feels like an author is sitting there trying to be profound when uh, about things that aren't necessarily profound. I, I would much rather she made a story about characters and, and show the interesting interactions with them in, in a dramatic story with conflict and, you know, traditional story things. And, you know, and it's not that I'm opposed to novels with like a sort of experimental structure. Um, you know, that I loved Jesse Greengrass's novel Sight, and so I'm not really sure why I didn't connect with this so much, but uh, I, I just didn't. So this just wasn't for me. I, I'm glad I gave up on it, uh, though I would like to try uh, reading another book uh, by the author at some other point. But then, taking up Kamal's suggestion for what he thought should be on the Booker International Prize shortlist, I started Go Went Gone by Jenny Erpenbeck, and this book is fantastic. He, he was right. Uh, it's about the story of a recent really, recently retired professor named Richard in Berlin and his interactions with a group of African refugees in the city. How he takes it upon himself to get to know them and uh, assist several of them in their lives. And that might sound like a cliched way of uh, trying a story trying to deal with uh, this topical issue of refugees and displacement and nationality, but honestly, it is so engaging and profound. I think it's a really profound book. It deals with language, it deals with society and history. It's very cognizant of the fact of how Berlin, uh, up until quite recently, was a divided city with a wall down the middle. And the question of how uh, Richard, as a child, um, he came very close to being a casualty of war who who um, almost got lost and uh, but but was uh, just rescued at the last minute. So it's sort of um, about the randomness of, of how some people are able to find security in their national identity where others are left out in the cold and become uh, sort of casualties of this fact. And then at the end, it takes a twist expounding on something which had been referred to about um, Richard's character throughout the book, but never like explicitly talked about. And it just left me with so much to think about. Uh, so yeah, I loved this novel. And lesson learned, always listen to Kamal. Okay, do you want to say it with me? Always listen to Kamal. <laughs> I read Anna Marie Crowhurst's debut historical novel, The Illumination of Ursula Flight. And okay, I read a lot of fiction that deals with like very sobering topics and it can be quite uh, depressing, um, like really interesting, but like depressing. And this novel was just a joy to read. Uh, it follows the life of a uh, girl um, who narrates it uh, from the very beginning of her life. Uh, she's um, a English girl from a privileged family, rural privileged family in the mid 1600s. And uh, it, it's written in a very old fashioned style, but um, also incorporates letters and uh, journal entries and these sort of um, play adaptations of play interpretations, like dramatic interpretations um, written in script form of scenes from her life um, in a really like imaginative way, which is all playful and fun and very evocative. Uh, and then as she gets older, um, she's sort of uh, forced into this arranged marriage and then it deals with her um, struggles to try to find independence and it becomes more serious while still being compulsively readable. Uh, so this is gonna sound like a weird comparison, but this novel to me sort of felt like a weird combination of Daniel Dutton's uh, novel Margaret the First in dealing with the intellectual life of a woman in the 1600s in England, but also like that story was placed in the Hundred Acre Wood. Like um, it's this sort of self-contained um, world where uh, you just sort of want the best for the characters and they encounter conflicts, but it's not too distressing. Um, but that's not to say that it's sort of like frivolous. It like 
uh, deals seriously um, with the, these issues that she faces, but uh, yeah, it just has this wonderful lightness to it. While also dealing with a woman struggling to make her artistic voice heard in an age which really didn't value women's intelligence. Uh, so yeah, and it, it was, it's just a great read um, and has such a beautiful cover. Oh, and it includes a scene with the most uh, creative names for sexual positions that you'll probably ever encounter. White Houses by Amy Bloom. And uh, of course, I, I wanted to read this novel because there's a quote from Joyce Carol Oates on the cover uh, who really admired it too. So it's the story told from the point of view of Lorena Hickok who is Eleanor Roosevelt's longtime lover. Now I'd heard like mentioned before about how Eleanor Roosevelt uh, was a lesbian or might have been a lesbian. And uh, the truth is like we, we don't honestly know what happened in Eleanor Roosevelt's bedroom, uh, but we do know that she did have a very close friendship uh, with this woman named Lorena, uh, who was a journalist that came from a very like humble, uh, struggling working class background. And uh, she writes, like her, Lorena's voice in this is so engaging and very like straight talking and quite often very funny. And she writes about her relationship with Eleanor Roosevelt in the most beautifully romantic way, like the, the scenes where she's talking about their love affair, their long-term love affair is just so beautiful. And she, I love how she writes how, like they're not conventional beauties, uh, but she, she writes how uh, what may not look beautiful does feel beautiful. And that's the most like empowering way of writing about a love affair where, um, in the bedroom, uh, people can really respect and love each other's bodies and learn to really love their own bodies as well and shrug off the societal conventions of the time. Uh, so this novel also deals obviously a lot with the, the politics of the time period, period in the mid 20th century and FDR's presidency and uh, prejudices at the time uh, uh, that was condemning uh, subversive behavior. So this novel was a big hit with me and I'd really recommend it. Problems by Jade Sharma. Uh, this is narrated from the point of view of Maya, a young woman who is having a lot of problems in her life and it's written in a very frank, uh, candid way, um, her talking about all of these problems in her life. And like, to be honest, at first I wasn't sure about it. I thought it was sort of, um, could have been more for like shock value, the way she, she talks about these things. But actually, it, I don't think it is. It, like I really got into the story and, uh, and how she, she deals with all these issues in her life. And it's sort of, you know, like a Holden Caulfield type story, like a voice of a generation, who um, is someone who feels this sense of disaffection and just can't really get into um, the groove of life of like having a um, successful relationship and um, getting really excited about uh, her profession or job or trying to find a job or, or pursue her studies and uh, who gets mixed in with drug abuse and, and you know, it's this sort of sense of a personality that just can't really connect with life in the way that society expects her to. But also it's a really funny book, like her, her voice and point of view is very funny and relatable even though she deals with a lot of serious topics and there's a section of the book which gets very serious but then there's also a section which is so relatable and funny when um, she has to go to uh, Thanksgiving dinner at her in-law's house and just all the awkwardness of going to the in-laws is just perfectly encapsulated in this book of this of her like feelings of self-consciousness of being there and the family trying to make gestures to feel her make her feel comfortable but those sort of failing and having the opposite effect and her doing the same thing of making gestures 
to try to integrate into their um, into their routines and into their Christian beliefs, uh, but just not fitting in. So this is a really powerful book with like a modern voice that I really enjoyed. I read Brother by David Cheriandi. Uh, this is a novel about a family of West Indian descent living in a, a largely immigrant working class tower block in a section of Toronto. It's narrated from the perspective of younger brother Michael who's lost his older brother and he's sort of reflecting on that and also um, dealing with his very mentally fragile mother. Uh, and it's sort of about the way that families, uh, like this family who essentially love each other uh, but who aren't able to fully connect uh, because they're not able to discuss things that are really happening in their personal lives. And so, uh, but also about the strains upon this family um, living in this working class community and, and uh, how they really struggle with money and, um, and with crime in the area. So it's sort of about family secrets, but it's done in this very subtle, low key way, which uh, felt really powerful and effective. But it's also about the struggles of this working class community in general and how Michael and people he knows uh, feel really disconnected from the larger society. So I thought it was a really like powerful and well done story. Pure Hollywood by Christine Schutt. This is a book of short stories which is slightly disarming in the way it uses narrative and its sort of approach to characters. Uh, the title story, Pure Hollywood, which is also the longest story in this book, is about a woman who um, has recently lost her very much older husband uh, who's left her with almost nothing and it's uh, about her um, finding a new place to live and her interactions with her brother and it's written this way that it sort of gets at this self-consciousness where it's sort of she sort of feels her life to be this film script but like not really a film script and so it's it's like or, or like how she's a woman like who's been released from this painting. And it's this way of getting at sort of self-consciousness in a way that's really striking and original. And other um, short stories in the book are uh, much shorter. Um, some are very like experimental in tone, especially the ones that are like only a page or two long. Um, they, they, they have a very like strange, interesting structure. And a lot of the stories use garden imagery or like flowers, but like not in a sort of beautiful way. They're sort of vaguely threatening um, and sort of express all the the passion um, that these characters feel as a way of like sort of bursting up but then like quickly wilting and dying as well. Uh, I think my favorite story in the collection is one called The Duchess of Albany which deals with a um, widowed woman, uh, older woman, um, dealing with uh, her garden and her sort of slowly sinking into alcohol alcoholism and her daughters who are trying to encourage her to get out of it but she's very defiant and strong-willed. Uh, so yeah I thought this was a really interesting book of short stories that I really enjoyed. From a Low and Quiet Sea by Donald Ryan. I've been so excited to get this book because I think Donald Ryan's writing is so powerful and moving and this book didn't disappoint. Um, he's an Irish writer who uh, always writes about Irish characters and situations to do, um, quite often to do with modern Ireland. Uh, so it's quite surprising that this book begins with a Syrian refugee who's uh, sort of corralling his family to escape their country. And, uh, but then it, it moves on to the stories of a couple other characters who are Irish and then gradually the way their, their stories intermingle with each other. I have to say, I thought the third character's story wasn't quite as engaging as the first two um, characters' stories in this, this book, but like the writing was always beautiful and insightful. And I love how he sort of framed the, the, the overall story of this book with two stories told in the beginning to um, a child where the first story is about the way that trees communicate with each other and then the second story was about a selfish king and the the sort of like moral or like the the central thought of these stories just sort of set the tone for the entire book in a, a way that I thought was really haunting and um, and really like I, I just kept remembering them in the back of my mind while I was reading the overall story and so I thought that was really effective like 
Donald Ryan, like I, I just would highly suggest you read any book by Donald Ryan because I think he is one of the best writers out there. And finally, uh, my second DNF of the month uh, was Unbury Carol by Josh Mallerman. I started this as a buddy read with Matthew Sharafa. I think we both got excited about reading it um, after seeing Jen Campbell talk about it on her channel. Uh, so this is about uh, Carol who has this condition, this chronic condition, where she periodically slips into a coma in, and she becomes so still that like you would think she was dead if you didn't know that she had this condition. And I liked the way that he described Carol when um, she's in this coma-like state uh, where it, he sort of describes her it as if she's like continuously falling and like how nightmarish that would be if you just feel like you're constantly falling for days on end. Uh, but the surrounding story, uh, uh, the story that surrounds it is, I found quite frustrating. The novel begins with the funeral of Carol's uh, gay best friend, who um, from the way he's described, he sort of sounds like the most interesting character in the book, but then when the novel begins, he's dead. So you don't really um, get much of his perspective and obviously he's not involved in the story. So that was sort of frustrating because then she goes on to describe these other characters who really aren't that engaging or interesting. Like I just couldn't get into their stories. Like there's this whole plot of somebody who's trying to um, claim that Carol is dead when she's in this state. Uh, but then uh, somebody, an uh, old friend of hers who's trying to rescue her. And then a man who's um, chasing this friend uh, who's trying to, to kill him, this like sort of bounty hunter. And just this, their, their stories just like, I don't, I didn't really get into them. And also he describes these terms, like these very broad terms, just referring to them as if you're supposed to know what they mean. Like there's this uh, place called the road, uh, which people travel on uh, that is supposed to be this like menacing place, this outlaw place. Um, and then there's this mysterious illness uh, which kills her best friend and uh, many other people, but you don't really know what it is. Um, like I assume later on in the book it might get into more of what these things are, but I just wasn't engaged enough to be able to stick with it. And I did like the way that he described how the, um, the hired thug uh, has these false legs which he sort of shoplifts with because he hides things in them. It was sort of a like quirky, um, strange way of describing that. But like otherwise, yeah, I just didn't really connect with the characters at all or just wasn't really that interested in them. And I just wasn't into it. Uh, so I put this book aside, but I think uh, Matthew persevered with it. So there you are. I hope you've had a good reading month. Let me know your thoughts on any of these books if you've read them. Um, and if you wanna know more of my thoughts about them, I'll post links to my full reviews in the description below, um, well, at least of the ones that I did actually finish. Uh, let me know if you've read any really great books recently and also let me know ones that you've given up on. I think it's really interesting the books we decide not to finish. Uh, so I hope you're doing well and take care.